Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning broadcast of Marvin Methodist Church in downtown Tyler, Texas. My name is Doug Baker and I'm the lead pastor. Today we conclude the season of Christmas celebration with a message brought to you by Reverend Brandy Stevens. Let's join in as her sermon is underway. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and, and in Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And as we're seated, let us turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. Almighty God, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace, open our hearts and our minds to your presence. We invite your Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, wake us from the sleep and inattention holding us back. Come Holy Spirit, meet us right where we are. Move us, come Holy Spirit, prepare us to receive your love as we celebrate the hope of Christ's birth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've been walking through a journey over the last several weeks leading up to this moment of Christmas. Christians around the world have been on this journey with us as well, intentionally entering into a time of waiting, a time of hoping and of longing that we know finds fulfillment in the arrival of the birth of Christ. And at the same time, looking ahead with hope to the return of Christ, knowing that he will keep that promise as well. Dr. Mark Donaldson has shared week in and week out recently throughout the journey that Christ came once. He comes repeatedly in word and in spirit, and he's coming back. We anticipate his final victory. Advent begins in a season of darkness. To really appreciate the coming of Christ the first time and that he will come again, we have to acknowledge the darkness, acknowledge how far our world is away from where God intended. Our relationships, our church, the world around us, so far from God's intentions. We're to be agents of reconciliation and yet we find each at each other's throats often. We're to be beating plowshares and, to, and studying war no more and yet it seems everywhere we look, we're arming up instead of disarming. And so Advent begins in darkness. This morning, Isaiah's text is one of the signature passages of Advent. It's vintage Isaiah, 
poetic vision of hope and the arrival of Jesus. And we return to it year after year. We read and we sing and we preach the familiar themes. And that's what's great about the scriptures and the text. And yet they come alive to us in different ways at different times. In our current moment, this is really coming alive, hitting me in a different way. Verse two of Isaiah's text says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Isaiah saw a hopeless situation, and yet he saw the light at the end of the tunnel. And John chapter one, using the New Living Translation, verse five declares, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness, let us hear this, the darkness can never be extinguished. The darkness can never extinguish it. The light is there the hope of Christmas in the light. The hope of Christmas because the protagonist stepped into the story. It's done something, he's done something that we could never do for ourselves. Isaiah says that the light spreads. You have enlarged a nation, the text says. The remnant in God's and God's care grows and it grows until we see Revelation, the ninth chapter. It's a great multitude that no one could number from every nation that no one could ever number from all tribes and peoples and languages, crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Way back in Genesis, God promised Abraham that he would multiply his children into a nation of people. From Abraham to all tribes and peoples and tongues, God is keeping his promise. The protagonist steps into the story. God takes on the suffering and grows it into a place of jubilation. But in the midst of the passage that we read this morning in Isaiah, there's a reference in verse four to a person who often isn't associated with the season. He gets no shout out in our carols, no mention in our Christmas cards, and not even a bathrobe cameo in the nativity story. But Isaiah compares the coming of our Savior to that he calls the day of Midian's defeat. This reference is back to Gideon, the story of Gideon. And yet, when was the last time that we even thought about Gideon in the midst of the story of Advent? This line, the day of Midian's defeat, refers back to Judges chapter 6 and 7, when Israel was being oppressed by their enemy. Now, although their sin and rebellion had invited this judgment, God, in his unrelenting mercy, raised up yet another rescue for his people. Once again, he selects an unlikely leader, armed with an unexpected instrument to carry out his unconventional strategy. Gideon shrinks his army to a mere 300 men, camps outside the Midian stronghold, and at the Lord's direction, they enact this ridiculous battle plan consisting of smashing clay pots, of blowing trumpets and holding up torches. And against all odds, the plan actually works. The mighty army of Midian is overthrown in confusion and fear before Gideon's army even raises a sword or draws an arrow. That's the kind of miraculous victory that God gives to his people. And yet he doesn't stop there. If we look at verse five, what we begin to hear is every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood, 
will be destined for burning. God will not only win the war for us, he will end the war itself. The warrior will no longer need his boots or the garments that have been rolled in blood. It will be put to an end. And the question becomes, well, how does he put it to an end? Not by Israel's strength, but by God's. This victory is not their accomplishment, nor is it ours, but it is God's accomplishment. Isaiah tells us that Advent is much like that. The arrival of our rescue in Jesus is an echo of what God did for Israel through Gideon. But as in the day of Midian's defeat, we're shocked when we consider the strategy. As we lean in to hear the battle plan, all that has ever made us afraid, every anxiety that we've ever carried, every fear that we've ever nursed, every difficulty that we have ever faced is answered as we lean in, as we lean in to hear the battle plan, the tactical genius of our mighty warrior, equipped with the strength of angel armies, and he goes with this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So the prophet Isaiah wrote this 600 years before Christ was born. He was saying, Israel, hold on because your savior, the son of God is on his way. And the first time he's coming as a baby, he's going to wrap himself in frail human flesh and become one of us so that we can relate to him, so that he can communicate his message of hope to us. Our rejoicing is only matched by our wonder. We've been watching for our rescue, but if we're honest, we never saw this coming. The second coming, he's not coming as a humble child. He's coming as king of kings, lord of lords. He's going to set up his kingdom physically to rule and to reign. The whole government will rest upon him in his shoulders. But until then, the kingdom of God is an internal kingdom for those who will allow him to rule and reign in their hearts and in their lives. And the disciples were confused by this because Jesus said the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is right here in your midst. And they were thinking, well, I guess he's going to set up his kingdom. And maybe we're going to be involved, but I wonder who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to be his right hand guy? And Jesus says, you don't understand. One day I'm going to return and set up my kingdom and the government and will rule upon my shoulders, will rule and reign. But right now I'm doing something more important. I'm allowing you to have my kingdom in your heart and in your life for all those who will allow me to rule and to reign. I want to encourage you to underline the words in your text, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. These are the four titles used for Christ in this prophecy. They describe his leadership, how he wants to live in our lives. His name represents his character, what you might think of as his promise in your life. Christ always fulfills his promise. Wonderful counselor with us always. Mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Isaiah tells us that Jesus will be, he will be there with us. He will listen, he will be our advocate and our counselor. 
He is our mighty God, our mighty warrior. Jesus governs with wisdom. We aren't his counselor, he is ours. Jesus governs with strength. He's not just any child, he's also almighty God. Jesus governs as father. He cares for us with the affection of a tender father. Jesus governs in peace. Peace at every level, vertically with God and horizontally with others. In these seven verses, Isaiah tells the story of how God wins our salvation for us. Our lives are hard. Church, they're really hard at some points. Jesus says in John chapter 16, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to underline those words. In this world, you will have trouble. Because see, most people tell you just what you want to hear, whether it's true or not. And yet Jesus says, I'm not going to lie to you. You're going to have trouble in this world. We're not in heaven yet. You're going to have problems and you're going to have pain. You're going to experience brokenness and hurt. You're going to have problems, but take heart because Christ has overcome the world. He's saying that whatever the problem is that you're going through, I've fought the battle and I can give you the victory. Our need is immense, so immense, but God's grace in Christ is greater still. There's no end into his supply for our need. And that's why in verse seven, we hear Isaiah say, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and holding it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Allow those words to sink in for just a moment. Allow us to recognize what those words are saying to us of increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. The reign of Christ will come, but it will not just come and be, it will come and increase. He will not only rule Israel, He will rule the world, the galaxy, the cosmos. His rule will not be like that of the Assyrians where war after war, once he conquers all evil, it will be one of peace. His kingdom spreads through peace and that peace there will be no end. There will be no pockets of rebellion. His victory will be total and complete. His kingdom, has no end. He fulfills all his promises. When established, it's upheld. It's just and it's righteous. It will last forever. And this is the good news. This is the good news for us and the world around us, for those living in oppression and injustice. All that evil is coming to an end in Christ. For in the days of Midian's defeat, it's only a story that he could write. Jesus is the perfect king, a king of justice and peace without end. If we accept Jesus as our great king, we have nothing to fear in him. He will always be for us, no matter how great or how small. In fact, the smaller, the better. The needier, the better. The more humble, the better. Jesus is king and savior to all who need him will never reach the limit of Jesus' strength, will never exhaust his storehouse of grace, will never outsin his patience, will never run so far that he can't find us, and will never fail so hard that he can't redeem us. The author of the protagonist stepping into the story of Advent explains that the arrival of our rescue in Jesus is an echo of what God did for Israel through Gideon. 
But in the day of Midian's defeat, we are shocked when we consider the strategy he employs to break our oppression and overthrow the threat against us. If you look back at verse seven, we find the seal of the promise. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. It means that God's passion for his own glory is driving this, that he isn't getting tired of saving, he's just getting started. The more he has to triumph over evil, the more his grace is seen and known. The needier that you and I are for his mercy, the greater his desire is to provide. Author Matt Leroy describes our rejoicing is only matched by our wonder. We've been watching for our rescue, but we never saw this coming. Wilder than clay pots and torches, we get a virgin singing a lullaby over a manger. A baby cries in the night, and hell trembles at the sound. For the days in Midian's defeat, it's a story that only he could write. Let us pray. Abba Father, as we sit in your presence this morning, Lord, we praise you. We praise you that Jesus is the new beginning, the final hope, the coming King the true promise. Thank you that Jesus was both fully human and fully God so that he could be our savior. Thank you that Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, God of angel armies. Give us your eyes to see you moving in ways that we could never expect. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you for watching our broadcast this morning. I want to personally invite you to join us for Sunday morning services here on our campus at 300 West Irwin Street in downtown Tyler. Please visit our website to learn more about our church or text NEW to 90382 to receive a personal response from our church. We'd love to have the opportunity to help you grow in your faith. If you'd like to make a financial contribution to the church, please use the QR code on the screen for online giving or send a gift to the church at 300 West Irwin Street, Tyler, Texas. I hope that you have a merry, merry Christmas.